to see everybody. Good. You sounded good in worship. That's great. As you can see, I'm not, pa- I know they did. I'm not Pastor Chris. I'm his wife, if you don't know me. Um, they're on their way. Maybe they've left for camp. I texted a little bit earlier, and they said that the, it was a mess, and so they were staying there to clean up. And so that's just like our crew, right? Our kids, they, they're they cleaning up. We have, like, I think it's 16 counting the adults. There's three adults. So that was a good crowd that we got to send up there, and so I'm sure we'll hear all about it when they return. Um, so like I said, I'm Pastor Chris's wife. If you don't know me, what I like to do is just get into the Word and use lots of Scripture. I don't have a bunch of fluff or something, so I'm just going to get into it. Okay, you guys ready? Yeah. We've been in Acts, this, we're going through the book of Acts, and we are starting in Acts 10. So if you have your Bible, or if you want to click on something on your app, or I don't know if you guys still use the little iPad or something if you brought it, um, I'll give you a minute to turn there. I am reading from the ESV, I don't know why that just stuck with me this week, but that's what I'm going to do. Okay, starting in Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 6, it says, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continuously to God, or continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. And then skipping to verse nine, it says the next day, As they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air, and there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, no, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that was common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. And this happened three times, and then the thing that was taken up into heaven. Okay, so in reading uh, chapter 10 in preparation for this message, I could see the Holy Spirit at work back there in the lives of believers in that region. And as he was tearing down some walls and some mindsets, and I can also, we know that he's doing that today. Um, I did a little research about the time, and it seemed to be about six or seven years after Jesus has read, had resurrected from the dead. Um, and from biblical history, we know that Peter walked closely with Jesus for about three years, and he had seen Jesus' life and Jesus' gentleness and his kindness his death and his resurrection, yet seven years after, Peter was still dealing with some old things, some old laws of Judaism, some old mindsets, and some old religious beliefs. I'm just assuming you all know about Peter, the one who's always sticking his foot in his mouth, right? (laughs) But we can tell that uh, he had made some progress in his mindsets because we find him at Simon the Tanner's house. In the Old Testament, you were considered unclean if you touched um, a dead body or a dead animal. And if you did, you had to go through all these cleansing rituals. And so as a tanner, this Simon the Tanner was constantly butchering and getting people the right meat for the perfect barbecue. Thank you for laughing at that. So... (laughs) So Peter was at the Tanners and went to the rooftop, as was custom to pray at the sixth hour, which is noon. Um, He was still in the Jewish practice of third, sixth, and ninth hour of prayer. And in uh, this area of the world, um, they have different roofs than we have. 
or they still do, they did back then and they still do have different roofs than we have in Redding, California. They are flat and they are considered like another part of their home, but it's just another level, but it's open. So you, you'd have kids up here playing, you would um, laundry maybe up there. And here Peter decided to go up and pray and he was hungry. And just in my mind, I was thinking Simon the Tanner is about to fix an amazing barbecue, for real. And he, uh, are you guys with me? It says that Peter fell into a trance. And I personally have never been in a trance. I will sense like God impressing something to me or give me a picture of something with a spiritual application, but I don't exactly know what it means to be in a trance. Um, but an embarrassing truth is I have been known to fall asleep while someone's talking to me. It's true. Yeah, I'm not the only one. Um, maybe it's their voice that puts you in a trance or they, can, they have the power to lull me to sleep. I don't know. I can actually fall asleep on a park bench. That is so true. It feels good. Um, so I also thought of this when I was preparing it. Pastor Jared, our old worship pastor, one time said after we ate dinner, he's like, oh, I'm in a food coma. And I'm like, what does that mean? But I figured it out. Anybody else been in food comas? I know now, but that was the first time I'd heard it. I thought it was funny. Um, and we may have all experienced food comas, right? Yep. Point being, don't get hungry on top of the Tanner's house. And now you're only thinking about food, right? Lunch is coming up. And you guys, I got food on your brain. Okay, we're going to get through the message. This is page two, so let's not stay distracted. Um, anyways, all of these clean and unclean animals, reptiles, birds of the air, were spread out on a sheet before Peter, and God told him three times to rise, kill, and eat. Peter had the audacity to tell him, nope. There's the foot in the mouth. But let's not attack Peter, because I know that we've all been there before, and I am so glad that we have other humans to look to. <laughs> that, oh, don't do that. Oh, you should act like that person, like the iron sharpening iron. Um, we have told the Lord no before. We might not say, no, my Lord. I say, no, God, but no, my Lord, if I've got my British accent on. But I want us to um, hang out on part 15, or sorry, verse 15 that says, what God has made clean, do not call common. I had to go to my Webster's 1828 dictionary because if you don't know, people are changing the definitions of words. And I don't know what the, who those people are, but they are. They seem to want to change them. So at first I just Googled common and Google says he's an American rapper. And I thought, that's not helpful. <laughs> Right? Have you guys heard of common? Oh, you have. I have not. Anyway, it's still it's not helpful. So then I went to dictionary.com, and it had some more generic adjectives and definitions describing it. But the 1828 dictionary that I go to had about 14 definitions, and some of those explanations are like a paragraph long. And so to break it down, the words for common are usual, ordinary, of no rank or superior excellence, not noble, not distinguished by noble descent or office, not distinguished by character or talents. So we're gonna read in a little bit, spoiler alert, that Peter preached his first sermon to the Gentiles in this chapter. So um, this sheet from heaven with all the unclean animals was symbolic for the message of the gospel to all. That the cross and the freedom that Jesus brought to all of the earth was for every human, every tribe, every tongue, every nation. That's good news, right? That's what the sheet means. Um, he, we know that he's our soon and coming king. So, but I want you to know that we are not common. It's talking of us as well. So I'm reading verbatim because I'm not as polished as my husband to get these notes out to you. So if I go off of my notes, I mean, come back and find it. I apologize. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much. So God was telling Peter not to count these people out. Uh, the gospel is for everyone, and what God is clean, do not call it common. We as Christians, then, are not common. Or sorry, we as Christians, then, are uncommon. 
We are distinguished, we are separated or known by a mark of difference, which I believe is the blood of the Lamb and that seal of the Holy Spirit. If one of the definitions of common is not distinguished by character, then we should be distinguished by character, and so on. Uh, we can learn from Peter that even after we have spent years with Jesus as disciples, that we will have to continue to learn and unlearn some things. And that's the hardest part, is to unlearn some things. Um, I want us to think about in our own lives what kind of rituals, habits, or lies do we put back on ourselves after Jesus has already broken, broke things off of us. Maybe it's been seven years for you, like Peter. Maybe it's 27 or 37 years, and we continue to have destructive mindsets that hinder us from experiencing a full freedom that God has provided through Jesus. I want to read here Luke 4.18. It's not up there, and you don't have to turn to it. But um, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed, go, to set the oppressed free. I really believe God wants us to live in that place, that freedom. Unshackled, not oppressed, and not blind to what's going on around us. Not tangled up inside when things are going wrong on the outside. Like Peter, do we say no, my Lord, when he asks us to walk in grace and love towards people who are acting unlovable? We'll have to unlearn some things to do that. Do we say no, my Lord, about having grace and patience with ourselves when we are having to unlearn some habits? It's a process. It took Peter seven years to get to this point. Are we patient enough to go through the process with our Heavenly Father of learning all, sorry, of learning what his love is towards us because you know we are with ourselves all day long. It's just us and him, right? And please know I'm not talking about maybe what the world or think people are teaching about. They want you to love yourself and that kind of love talk. It's different with the Lord. And some of you might be... Um, <laughs> feeling a little uncomfortable right now that I'm talking about loving yourself or love towards yourself. But in a few moments, we're going to dive deep into what love is. And I know I don't fully understand it. That was not me. I touched nothing. It looked like I did, but I was like right here. That we, we were supposedly got that fixed. It's not supposed to happen. I'll put that on our list of things to do. Stop. Okay. Um, where was I? Thank you, Jesus. You guys are awake now. Okay, I was saying, I don't fully understand love, and I'm beginning to be uh, more and more aware that we, the church, and people in general, are not always operating out of love. It's easy to talk about love, but not understand it. We have been trained on a performance-based love. When we do good, we feel close to God. And when we don't perform well enough, God is distant. And I want to tell you that that's just the opposite of who and how God is. That is a lie from Satan, the deceiver. And sometimes to describe something, it's easier to describe it by what it's not. Love is not fearful. Love is not people-pleasing. Love is not an obsession, and it's not lust. I have in no way arrived, so as I'm teaching this, I'm trying to walk it out through the process, too. So it feels like it's been a few years in the making um, at this point in the process. So I got like a seed faith by reading and praying. I broke up some hard ground. I planted that seed, did some watering fertilized it, so to speak, around me, and I did some weeding and some more watering, and then one day a tiny little sprout came up, and then a bud, and then a flower, and that tiny flower is like my tiny understanding of the Father's love. More and more each day, I'm experiencing the Father's love and seeing his love grow in me. So I'm going to ask us some questions, you and me. And I want you to think about these maybe during the week. You'll remember them. Maybe something will um, jog your memory to remember these. But do you guys 
sit and think about the joy of the Father? Amen. That's good to hear. What about the joy that he has over you? That he's pleased with you? That he is delighted in you? Good. That is so good to hear. Before we leave our homes in the day, do we just um, maybe tell ourselves, God loves me, or God made me and loves me so much? Do we ever think about his mercy? And how he wants us to show the same mercy that he has given to us. We need to show that to other people. Oh, you guys are good. Okay. And then, uh, do we meditate on a loving, gracious father who, by the Holy Spirit, talks to me, helps me find rest, is not irritated with me, is approachable? Shows me what peace is and wants me to have peace. And these are good questions, and it sounds like a lot of you are on the same page, so I like that. And then I got sidetracked about peace. I wanted to make sure I explained peace to you guys. It's so much more than this, but um, he wants you to have shalom. He wants us to have shalom. And it's a deep, deep word that is more than just um, a time with no war. It's also wrapped up in completeness and wholeness and safety and tranquility and rest and soundness. If you do a deep study on the word peace, he gives all of his children peace. Okay, unsidetracked. I'm going to go back to the message. John 3.16. I'm sure it's one of the most quoted scriptures in all of history. Can we say it together as a church in the King James Version? I butchered it in the last one. I put one word from another translation. So, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Amen. So John 3.16 says it so beautifully about love and us. I'm trying to get us to think about the Father's love. The Greek, we're going to break it down and just that word loved in the Greek. Um, the Greek word for loved is agapao. It's the verb. And please humor me that I'm saying it right. You know I'm saying it right. Agape is the noun. Together they are unconditional love love by choice, and by an act of the will. So for God so gave, had unconditional love that he gave. So God, for love by choice and an act of his will, he loved us that he gave Jesus. Um, the word denotes also unconquerable benevolence. Unconquerable benevolence and undefeatable goodwill. Those are strong words. Agapo, agapao will never see anything but the highest good for the other person, no matter what he does. It does not need a chemistry, an affinity, or a feeling. And it was interesting, you know, it's not the phileo love, it's not the eros love, it's agape love. And so it's interesting that um, it's a word, it says, in which Christianity gave new meaning. Outside the New Testament, it rarely occurs in existing Greek manuscripts. So Christianity gave this word to the world. Um, it is the self-giving love that gives freely without asking anything in return, and it does not consider the worth of the object. Isn't that good? Some of us still struggle with unworthiness, so when God so loved the world that he gave his son, he was not looking on your worthiness that you were worthy of it. It's that grace that we always talk about. So I just think it's an amazing word to consider over and over again. And then I was reading this book, and these two words, that they just stuck out to me. It said, live loved. And I don't even remember what the author had to say about lived loved. I just really liked them. And she said she stole it from another author, and she gave that author credit. But... After I took that saying, live loved, and for my own, and I meditated on it, I really believe that for me and for us to be healthy and nourished in our heart 
and in our mind and in our soul and to produce the right fruit in the right seasons and to not wither in harsh environments. To live love would look like us remembering first God's love towards us, that whole definition that I just read about pertaining to John 3, 16. And then you could also put that in any other place in the Bible where it's talking about Christ's love for us or God's love for us. And second, when we walk with him, we think the highest good about people. Third, when we pray to him, know we are loved. When we choose to spend time with God, it shouldn't be, okay, I just checked off that box. We should get it from our prayer time, refilled with love, so to speak. We should come out of our prayer closet in love and come from it being loved so that from that place of being loved, we're knowingly letting it change how we interact with other children, God's children, because sometimes we don't play nice. We are not nice with our tongue. <laughs> Sometimes with their thoughts too. Okay, so back up to verse, we'll pick it back up at verse 28. I think I have that one. So Acts 10, 28. It says, um, where Peter came to Cornelius' home and he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. So Cornelius repeated verses 1 through 6. And then in verse 33, it says, So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So this is where Peter preached his first sermon to the Gentiles. I just love how the Holy Spirit spoke both to Cornelius, where he was, and Peter on the roof two days journey away. And they both separately had to come into this agreement or this uh, like a Holy Spirit appointment. And they both had to hear. And so I have recently, um, I have an example from Chris's in my life. And I, I recently stepped down from working in the office. And I just felt that I needed to step down for a couple different reasons. Um, and I shared those with my husband, and it didn't take him long to agree that this was what it should be. This was the right move to make. And I was initially supposed to be done in December, but it didn't happen. I said, that's fine, okay, I can stay till the end of May, but I really, I need to be done at the end of May. And then the Cochrans, if you guys remember them, they gave us word that they were leaving at the beginning of May. So I said, okay, so I'm sitting there praying, okay but I still need to go, even though it looks like we don't have anyone to fill now two part-time positions. And we had asked someone previously if they would um, work in there and they declined. But just keep in mind, we were praying the whole time. The council was praying, Chris and I were praying, but we still knew it was the right thing to do. Um, at the end of April or beginning of May, I was just talking on the phone with our oldest daughter who had um, held both of the positions four years earlier, but she had moved away to Nevada uh, to help another church family there, to work for them. So I just told her, yeah, I'm supposed to quit at the end of May, but we don't have anyone to fill the position. And she's like, I didn't know you were quitting. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm quitting. Didn't dad tell you? And she's like, no. So I told Chris, maybe you should call her. She seemed a little bit interested. And she was, and she said, okay, I will pray and see what I'm supposed to do. And I said, and we said, okay, we'll pray. And she did get back to us, and she's coming and working. She works for us now. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. So she had to pray. The council was praying. We all had to have this Holy Spirit. It seems like it was a Holy Spirit appointment. of It was happening in Nevada, and it was happening here. And he can, God would confirm it with all of us. So that's my little example. Now, moving back to Cornelius, um, one of my favorite parts in this whole passage is verse 4b. It says, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Can you imagine that if God said that to you? Your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial. I just think that's an awesome thing. So I made a highlights of Cornelius. I don't have a slide, so I just, I'll just read them here. It says, um, he and all his family were devout and God-fearing. It looks like his family respected and honored him. 
He gave generous to those in need and prayed to God regularly. We see that he's aware of the needs around him. He sent his men like the angel told him, and the men did as he said, so we see obedience and love. His own men were talking to Peter, and they said, he is righteous and God-fearing. He's respected by all the Jewish people. And then in verse 27, uh, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. So we just see that he has connection with people in the most loving and righteous way. And so from those highlights that I found about Cornelius, I connected them, that same love that I was talking about earlier, to Cornelius. And you can tell that Cornelius operated out of being loved, that he lived love. He knew what love was because his prayers and his alms went up as a memorial before the Lord. He was surrounded by relationships that he had built on love. People listened to him and let him lead and have a place of leadership because he treated them lovely. He was not demanding or controlling and snapping his fingers, though he probably could have because he had, um, he was the boss, so to speak, over a hundred men in the regiment that he was a leader of. But it sounds like that they all loved him. They were all gathered around him. And it doesn't seem that he went to his prayer closet just to check it off like I did my duty today and just go on his own way. So now I just want to turn to, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. And I wanted to draw out of it like Cornelius' life stacked up against the love chapter. And I sense that the Lord gave me this, and this is why his prayers maybe were up before the Lord, as a memorial before the Lord. So 1 Corinthians 13, I'll give you a second to turn there or click there. It says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. We can see Cornelius was a man who had a tongue, and like all of us, our words have power behind them. We can see by the company around him and the large crowd that gathered at his house that he was a man that showed love, and he wasn't a clanging cymbal. Verse 2, if I have prophetic powers... And understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. As we read earlier, he had a heavenly encounter, a vision, and God spoke. He may have been operating in prophetic powers and maybe had some word of knowledge. It shows that he had real faith to believe and acted upon that belief to send men to Joppa. In verse 3, if I give all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. We already read that he gave alms generously, and his prayers and his alms have ascended as a memorial. So I just think he definitely got God's attention. Verse 4, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant. If love is patient, then love is long-tempered, mild, and long-suffering. It has the capacity to bear up under difficult circumstances, not with a passive complacency, but with hopeful fortitude that actively resists weariness and defeat. If love is kind, then love is likened unto philanthropy, hospitality, and a readiness to help. Human friendship is uh, defined in here and taking thoughts of others. Sorry, taking thought of others. Love has patience with imperfect people. It doesn't envy, since it's non-possessive and non-competitive. It's not arrogant. It actually wants other people to get ahead. In verse 5, or rude, I don't know why. Or rude is at the end of the sentence and the breakup of the verse. But it's not rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. Love is not puffed up. It does... It only displays good manners, doesn't insist on its own rights, and does not demand precedence. It's not irritable or touchy, rough or hostile, but graceful under pressure. Is this making sense? I'm giving a lot of definitions. 
breaking down words so that we remember to think about the meaning of words and meditate on it and just not just gloss over the love chapter. We have to remember that as we're reading our Bibles, it's not a sprint. Though at this time, I think some of you might be thinking, okay, Tori, sprint to the end. Let's do this. But I assure you, we are descending. We're going somewhere. We're landing soon. We can see that Cornelius marked, was marked by love, and he was not common. He was distinguished. He was separated by a mark of difference. He had an honorable reputation. And I just there I want to remind us of how John 3.16 applies. We read the definition of it, and it's just so good. Um, and I want us to think of the depth of love that he has for us, for you and I, that he gave us a son. He also gave us the example of how Jesus lived on the earth, so that's our example. He gave us the cross and the resurrection and now continues to take care of us via the Holy Spirit. Okay, Corinthians 6, I'm almost done with this. I'm only going to 8. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. You had uh, Pontius Pilate ask Jesus, what is truth? And today you have people not knowing what truth is, but we know, we're reading it right now, love rejoices with truth. Truth is certainty, stability, right, rightness, trustworthiness, Truth conveys a dependability, a firmness, and a reliability. To be firm, permanent, and established. Verse 7, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And the word believe here is closely related to faith, and some of the definitions are the same as for truth. So faith, truth, and believe are, it's amazing that they're just so, uh, they're knit together here. So some of the same words are firm, stable, and established, to be firmly persuaded. This word for believe is ahman, and from ahman comes emuna, faith, which the most famous Hebrew derivative, amen. In Ghana, they say amin, and some of us say amen or amen. It's like amen or amen, I don't know. It's amen. But it conveys the idea it is solidly, firmly, surely true, and verified and established. And then when I read that, I thought that was interesting. It made me think of uh, when we pray and say amen, what, we're, what we just prayed, was it solidly, firmly, surely, true, and verified, and established? It's probably a good thing why we should be praying more, not my will, but your will be done because it's solid, firm, sure, verified, and established. Okay, um, we'll finish up with verse 7. Um, love hopes all things. And that just means there is an expectation, something yearned for and anticipated eagerly, as in God's promises. It's not wishful thinking about, uh, it's not wishful thinking without foundation, but it's the sense of a confident expectation based on solid certainty. And then finally, love never ends. And I just say that stands alone because I just went through like 20 minutes of what love is. So if you guys want to go study that some more, love never ends. And let's remember those words about love. Okay, so since Cornelius' prayers and alms went up before the Lord, as a memorial, I can safely conclude that he knew what love was and operated from it from a place of being loved by God. God didn't think that he was common. He was distinguished, he walked in freedom, he was generous, he was separated and marked by God. And I just want to conclude here about how to operate from a place of being loved. Maybe someone needs help in this, so I just want to encourage you that when you go to God in prayer, how's about going to him with the heart of John 3.16 that we just read about and the heart in, behind 1 Corinthians? When you go to God in prayer, how's about... Um, or that's not what I meant to say, sorry. Scratch that, I just said that. I was reading my notes. Um, I was going to say, when you go to God in prayer, how's about going, oh, I said it again. This is why you don't go verbatim off your notes. Let's reverse that and go back. What did I want to say? The heart of 1 Corinthians, the heart of John 3.16. 
Love is patient. We know God is patient. And if God is patient with you, he wants you to be patient with others. When you think on God's kindness towards you, that is how you should feel kindness towards other people, and so on and so on. You could go down the list in Corinthians. Um, you could continue to break down that passage. Now, it may look different for some of you at different times, and I'm not telling you a formula or something that you, you don't know, but maybe for some of us, it's just a way to start. And then you go from here, learning more about love and practicing living it. And at this time, I want to encourage you with that, when you're practicing it, please slow down. Really pause. Take time to be with the Lord. Take time to meditate on his word and what you just read and ask the Holy Spirit to breathe life into what you just read and we're supposed to act upon it. It's not a rush to be in his presence. I think Pastor Chris mentioned a few um, weeks ago, and I think it's scientifically confirmed that we think like 80,000 thoughts per day and half are negative. I don't think that should be as the church. Um, I really want to see people walk in freedom, and I think it may start with us beginning to practicing letting God's, God fill us with his love each and every day. So I encourage you to learn a new habit when you're studying the Bible. Maybe you don't study this way, and I just encourage you to slow down and start taking the words apart and letting the Holy Spirit do a work in you with those words. And it's gonna take patience. You're gonna have to have patience with yourself and let God, um, through his love, change the way you think about yourself and all your self-talk that you do. Amen? Amen means it's finished. Okay. That is it, and I don't have good, um, I'm just going to close. <laughs> I don't have good transitions. So, so if you guys want to pray, pray with me. Bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, God, that we are your sons and your daughters, and that you love us so, so, so much. God, I pray that you would help us to just dig in to and the depth and the width and the height and the love that you have for us, that you'd help us to dig into that, God, and just to uncover, God, those thoughts that you have towards us, to apply it to our own life, God, and then from that, that we can walk it out and show other people. God, as we read your word, it's supposed to change us, God. It's not just supposed to sit there stagnant, it's supposed to transform us, God. It's supposed to do something after we get up and read, after we spend time with you, God. We pray that the word has its perfect work in us. God, as Jocelyn sang that song, Lead Me to the Cross. There's so many good words, good um, lines in it, God, but that part about to your heart, too, and the bridge, that it is your heart for us to know you more, to love more, to be loved more, to let you just pour into us, God, and in turn, we can pour out to other people. God, we thank you for the freedom that you bring, the change that you bring, God, that, um, Maybe we've collected some new habits or put stuff back on us that you don't want us to have and that you don't want us to walk in. God, I just pray that people, and myself included, God, would just know what your freedom is and not let those things be attached to us, Lord God, that we, the church, God, can do the mission, do what you've called us to do, the commission to go out, God. And I pray that if we live from a place of love, that we would know how to love on people and in every situation that you bring to us, that we would be on the lookout for it, how to bless someone, how to be kind, how, what love is, God, in every, at the grocery store, every situation. We don't have to just keep walking from one thing to the next, God, that we would slow down and see what you would have in that moment. I pray, God, that you bless this church. I pray that you would work this out in us, God, if it something hits us, Lord God, from this message, that it would just get deep roots, Lord God. 
for your glory in your son's precious name.